My name is Martin Kelly. I'm editor of French Journal. And in our October issue, uh, we focused on money and economics. And we had an article by John M. Coleman uh, entitled, When Quaker Process Fails. And we're very happy to have John Coleman here uh, on the line with us. Hi, John. How are you? Good morning. Thank you for having me. Hello. Thanks for coming. And can you uh, talk a little bit about the uh, article and uh, what you uh, uh, shared with uh, views on my Quaker process and how Quakers uh, work and don't work? Certainly. I, th I think that in a nutshell, what I suggest in the article is three things. One, that Quakers in numbers and in many other ways have been in decline. Two, that there's no reason for us to have been in decline. And three, that if we look back to our own roots and our own idea of Quaker process, and if we are true to that, we can reverse the decline. And um, some people have worried that this is a sort of a, an attack on Quaker process or sort of misunderstanding Quaker process. And uh, is that, was that your intent uh, in this article? Far from it. I, I think Quaker process is something that when it's true to its original values is useful far beyond Quaker environments and, and works exceptionally well in Quaker environments when it's done right. But done right is really a rabbit in the hat. I think you, you need, again, if I can be the person of three points, I think you need three things for it to work well. The first is you need really good clerking. And we could talk about that all day, but that, that really good clerking includes the ability to hear things that are not spoken, that can provide a pathway to an intelligent solution. And the second thing you need for Quaker process to work well and to function at its best is you need a high level of mutual trust among the people who are participating in the decision. The third thing, in my experience, that's important is you need intelligent listening and an active listening that and that those are vague words but here's exactly what I mean by it you have to have the sort of listening in which people are trying to hear the underlying concern of another friend rather than just the words and in that kind of intelligent listening you would not find people seize on one word and go off on a tangent you would you would see people really getting the core idea that was behind perhaps poorly phrased words. Those three things together, if they're all being honored, what you're probably going to find is that more in line with our history than the way we've been going recently, people will respect expertise. They won't think that there is that of financial expert in every friend. And people will believe in individual accountability and so on. You also find, I think, a higher ethical standard with a lot less nepotism. Sure. And, and how do we get there um, from here? Um, you know, sometimes, you know, many meetings, uh, I think people have resonated with some of the problems of accountability that you've seen, uh, that you uh, showed. Um, so how do we get there from here? I know uh, one of the examples you were using was filled up yearly meeting and they've um, made some responses. So how do we sort of get to that point where we have the, you know, the the three that you listed there, the solid leadership and uh, mutual respect. Well, there actually are a lot of good examples, and they are indeed found in some monthly meetings. I wish there were a lot more, but there are enough to have us not completely despair or, you know, just um, give up on it. And I let's keep the names out of it, but I think of one particular monthly meeting, which is not my own, it's, it's across the river from, from me, but in this meeting, what you have is, A, they figured out who was the best person to do the clerking. Mm -hmm. They did not impose artificially short term limits on that person. They didn't have a very large meeting. One person was spectacularly more talented than other people at the incredibly demanding job of clerking. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they found that person and they didn't throw that person out after two years. Mm -hmm. I think the second thing they did is they, they coached each other, brought in an outside facilitator on listening skills. And the, again, that sort of constructive listening, active listening, I suggest. And the third thing is that meeting is really open to outside help. They got help from other monthly meetings. 
They got help from Philadelphia Yearly Meeting on, on certain matters, and they got help from non-friends. Those are the things that I think anyone can do. I, I recognize that a monthly meeting or a quarterly or yearly meeting is a more complicated entity than a Quaker social service organization from a governance standpoint. Uh, but that doesn't make that that's not an excuse for it to be ungovernable. Uh, you you still have a need for the enlightened clerking that can find solutions that are not obvious, that can hear the concerns that are under the surface. You still need to find a way to build the level of trust, and you still need this this uh, positive, constructive listening. And I think that leads you to humility. Ability to self-criticize and say, "Okay, we've got some great strengths. We've also got some weaknesses." And humility also says, "We can't have eight priorities. If we have eight priorities, we'll do them all poorly." Mm -hmm. okay. um, and I think we have time for just sort of one more question. And um, you mentioned earlier that you um, use Quaker process with non-Quakers. That you've yes. shown this process out. How, how has that been, and how has that been received? Does it does it work? It works. It works phenomenally well. Uh, and here's where it works best in collegial organizations and that's not an isolated small part of America that's what boards of directors are and boards of directors in America are infinitely more important than they were as recently as 10 years ago there's a corporate governance revolution going on I'm, I'm reading this morning in the Wall Street Journal about the non-executive chair of Citicorp uh, planning the firing of the chief executive. Boards of directors are the epitome of collegial bodies of equal partners, as are major partnerships like certain law firms. And the only way they can be well governed is to follow the principles that we know as Quaker process. So it's, it's very applicable out there and sort of a natural way for collegial groups to, to work together. It is. People have to feel they're heard, but where we go wrong and where we've gone wrong in in Quaker society in recent years is it's not about a nose count it's not about listening to the loudest speaking person it's about looking for the weightiest argument that's a very Quaker statement that goes back to the 1600s we've always been in a search for the weightiest um, s solution the best idea which might be between two fairly good ones Mm -hmm. And that's uh, there's plenty of room for that in business. I don't buy this notion that uh, Quakerism and Quaker process makes things too slow. That's not true if you have the mutual trust. Mm -hmm. That's not true if you have a really good leader, if we're allowed to use that word, or let's say clerk. Okay. Well, uh, I think it's about all the time we have. So uh, thank you very much, John. And uh, thank again, you, this Mark. is uh, from the uh, October issue. Uh, I'll highlight it there the October issue, a French journal. Uh, which is titled Wall Street, Main Street, and Meeting House Road. And you can uh, subscribe instantly online at friendsjournal.org slash subscribe. Um, and uh, there's also uh, links here to a, a great uh, issue in 2006 on Friends and Money um, that has some great articles too. So plenty to, to do there. Uh, again, just go on to the friendsjournal.org website. So uh, thank you very much, John. Thanks, Martin. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.